Hi, everybody. I'm T. Ferguson. Welcome to The Distillery. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation developed and designed for and by our creative media community. And I'm Patrick Jager. And each episode of The Distillery is an opportunity to talk about the things that are affecting us right now, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then talk about the next. Where do we want to be three, six, nine, 12 months, years out, uh, and how do we get there? But as always, we start the conversation by looking at the results of our latest poll. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, what was our poll this week? Uh, yeah, so we asked folks if they thought that budgets and client expectations could allow for true creativity. And especially given what our current situation is and production restrictions and storytelling restrictions and all the hurdles that, ever, that everybody's facing in this creative community. Um, the results were, were yeah, I, I think, kind of what we might have expected. Uh, we gave three people three options. So it was, yes, creativity is always the goal, or it was, no, something has to give what that something could be, TBD, uh, or three was creativity or bust. Creativity at all costs, that's, that, is the, that is the benchmark. Um, interestingly enough, yes, uh, that's always the goal. That was 8% of our, of our polling audience. 25% uh, said creativity or bust. And then a sobering, 67% um, said, no, something has got to give. You know, it's interesting. About that. It's, I think as a service industry, and so many of us in the creative communities are, at the end of the day, hired for what we do. So I can understand where it's something has got to give because in most cases, you have a client that's saying something's got to give and you have to figure out how to do it. But the flip side of that, and why I find that number kind of surprising is that you know, I've always found that the more you put parameters and define and make something hard, the more innovative you are. That's the time that you don't fall back on your laurels. That's the time that you say, hmm, how can I use a different type of camera setup? You know, I've been very impressed with some stuff that's been done really to push boundaries during, yeah. during the pandemic because people had to. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah, I, I think it's, I'm a little mixed too, uh, to be honest. I think we're redefining what creativity is mm -hmm. in a sense. And a lot of us fall into a very specific lane and we say, oh, this is how we be creative. This is how we are creative. Um, but now the creativity is coming in, like you said, doing things differently, producing things differently, uh, figuring out how to do stuff remotely. Uh, yeah, all of it, uh, all of it. So, you know, there's a different type of creativity, I think, that's layered yeah. through everything right now. Well, I think that's good. But, you know, at the end of the day, people didn't tune in to see the two of us talk about this. They wanted our guests to talk about it. So we have three sure, guests yeah. today. T, you're up. Who's first? First up, we have Hannah Lori Gomes. Welcome, Hannah Lori. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. <laughs> good, good. It's lovely to have you. Hannah Lori is an editor, a documentary filmmaker, an activist. She is also a mother, and she wants uh, to make sure that we emphasize that she misses naps and she misses sleeping in. And um, I sort of get it, even though I'm not a parent. Uh, Anna Laurie and I have worked together in the past on a variety of projects. I'm thrilled to have her. She, I can speak to the to the fact that her creativity knows no bounds, um, and she's a really precise storyteller, which which can be seen in in, in her editing skills. Um, so welcome, Anna. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, when we talk about budgets and creativity, you know, there's that part of me that's like the scrappy you know, film school person still, you know, all these years later after being out of film school, I'm like, look, I can make something creative with nothing, you know, and many times I have, but I will say <laughs> that um, there have been times this year when you're working on other people's projects, right, and they have their creative and you're bringing your creative to the table. And if they have a concept and you're trying to like flex within that to like really illuminate the idea, but then there's a budget restriction, you're like, okay, well, how somebody does have to give here. So I, if, if I am going to make this thing within your parameters and you don't have the money for your idea, then we have to start to reevaluate what the goal of the idea is and adjust and flex within that. Um, but, you know, really only one project out of a lot of projects that I've worked on since March has that even been an issue. And you can see it in the like finished products. You're like, yeah. <laughs> there is that old adage, time, talent, treasury, pick two. And you're so right. if you're gonna if you're gonna lose the treasury, you gotta rely on the talent and, the, and time. Um, all right, next up, Hannah Lori, thank you very much, I agree with you. Next up, we have a professional photographer, John Loomis. John and I have recently been introduced and he is best known for an energetic creative portraiture, uh, celebrities, 
you know, incredible uh, events. He's been featured in every magazine you can imagine. But his passion for storytelling inspired from, from photojournalism. And in 2019, John founded a, a podcast, Eyeball, that's all about the passions of photography and creativity. Now, I have been told by our mutual friends that you are known to have an opinion, John, and I think that will be an excellent addition to today's topic. So welcome. What, what's the excellent. chances that someone who founds a podcast has an opinion? I mean, it almost have, never happens. Who would have thunk? Well, so what's your opinion? Uh, creativity or bust? Uh, something's got to give? What are you thinking? I think that... What we now know is the majority of the people who respond to your surveys are actual professionals because there's always a compromise. That's just how we make the sausage in whatever creative field we're in. And I think that the further you get down in your career, there are, there are things, there are lines in the sand for sure. But the further you get down the career, I think what you said about finding creativity when things are hard is what ultimately, you know, my background is in journalism and in editorial world and advertising. And so there will be things that go wrong, 1,000%. It's definitely going to happen. So it's really always been about what's your B plan, C plan, D plan, E plan, F plan, and about in the room deciding what was really important about the first thing. You, what was the germination of this whole thing? So I, I am totally excited about people who, you know, the artists I most love, the people who felt no compromise was, was possible. They would, you know, give no one any quarter. It was all about their vision. Professionally speaking, as soon as you're working with anyone else, that's just that's a that's a fable. That's not how people work together. And so I'm better when I'm working with someone who has a vision and I can find out how our visions work together. I like working with others, I like collaborating. So there is there's little tiny compromises all around us. Also, I'm married uh, and I have kids. So I, I don't I, there's almost no sense of self I have left, you know. So I've I've already seeded all the territory. Uh, I'm seeing a lot so of head nods to that one, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, creativity is fantastic, but I like to put creativity to work in order to actually engage with an audience. You're working with other professionals and if you're smart, you're listening to them and you're, you're, yeah. and you're taking all the best ideas and you're trying to build something together with an eye on the budget. And as soon as the budget on anything, there are compromises, you know, and, and I, I mean, I don't even work in television. I imagine that supersedes all the other things we're talking about. So you know, I, I think there's always going to be a happy medium. And it's when you have all those barriers, that's when you really can find incredible creativity and art being made. Welcome, John. We love, we love opinions. So last but not least, uh, we have our special guest who will be a bit in the hot seat later for our two-on-one segment. Uh, uh, Joey Chavez is the EVP of Original Drama Programming at HBO Max. Welcome, Joey. Thank you. Hi. Uh, after 15 years as a television executive, Joey is currently uh, at HBO Max, which, as we all know, launched not, a, not but a few months ago during, uh, during the pandemic. There, he oversees the entire drama slate of shows, and uh, he's a music junk junkie. He's a dog dad. He's a rare industry local, a true Los Angelino who grew up blocks away from t TV and film studios. He also went to USC Film School, and he still calls uh, uh, Los Angeles his home. Still here. Uh, yeah, no, but, uh, but it's so interesting to hear you guys talk about your perspectives, because for me, I'm on the other side, which is I tend to either manage or, you know, uh, share the budgets with the creative folks that I'm working with to go execute. And so, you know, I always have to sort of be the defender and champion to make sure the budgets are right for the creative goals. Like you were saying, Hannah, I think it's all about clarity in conversation and communication about well, what, what are we trying to achieve? But I will say in my world, the, the strangest thing is not that every project just has brand new goals and we're just going to come up with something, but the goals have been set in some ways for television production. And so going back to to work, the, the same thing that you want to achieve is so much harder and more expensive to do. So it's like all the people on set, they've done this a million times, they know how to do the job, but with all of the extra steps and time and testing and safety protocol and all the things that are most paramount and most important, um, everyone understands that. But I think it, it does something a little psychologically to you, much like I'm sure everyone feels to go to the grocery store now it takes like double or triple the time just to get a box of cereal and milk. And I think that there's a similar professional thing going on too, where people just are like, very, uh, you know, uh, eager to get back to work, but also it's different. It's just a different way of doing it. And so either the budgets have to adjust accordingly, 
or you have to let some things go and, and figure out, well, what, because this is going to take double the time, um, isn't worth it. And we're finding some smart efficiencies, I'll be honest with you. Not everybody that's always been on a set needs to be on a set. So there's some good that comes from it, too. And I, I do default to, back to the original question, that it's always good to have kind of creativity born from some of those challenges. And I've definitely seen that, that side of it, too. T and I put this, uh, this video cast together because we were having all these conversations with friends and colleagues, uh, really talking about what are we going to do? Like, it doesn't feel the same. And I think we can all agree that the normal is no longer normal. The new normal, which I hate that word, by the way, or that's the phrase, but the new normal is going to be whatever it's going to be. And we're not there yet, but in the now, what are your biggest challenges and what you see as the biggest kind of cool things that are coming out of this uh, time of isolation and uh, revision that we're in right now. Who wants to start with that? I would say um, they're sort of two in the same for me. It's that I'm becoming hyper aware of my waves of creativity through this situation. So I, I have to tap in more to like right now, there's not a well, this moment is, isn't providing me with a creative solution. So what's a better way that I can spend my time right now? Because I have to really take advantage of the moments when my four-year-old isn't running around the house. So since I'm, I'm not like at the office and I'm like, oh, well, somebody else is going to have to take care of him right now. I have to. So I have to say like, okay, right now there's a creative energy in me. Let me take advantage of that. Or right now it's not creative, but I still have to get work done. What can I do that doesn't need that side of my brain so that I can maximize it? So it's the challenge of that right now. And I don't really like it. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's making me really aware of how how I ebb and flow creatively throughout the course of the day. Cause it's, it's not like a whole day I'm dry, but there just might be a moment, you know, and you have to respect it, or at least I do. <laughs> there's a follow-up though to that, which is that, you know, there's a lot of complaints that people aren't as efficient mm. being at home in the statement you just made. Do you think having those pockets of, you know, those moments of creativity mean that you're being more efficient when you are being creative or do you, do you agree that it like right now efficiency is down? Uh, my efficiency is high because I'm an editor and I have like a lot of deadlines and a lot of things that I have to present. So if I wasn't going to keep up with my efficiency, I would have to change my job <laughs> because people really expect an editor to like turn stuff around. You get notes you need to present. And so I don't have the choice to be less efficient or else I just, yeah, I don't sure. <laughs> but I, but I like to be that way. I'm sort of a, you know, workaholic. <laughs> That's good. John, what's your thought on this? Well, I think to start where you left off, I think efficiency and measuring efficiency is the word, like the worst way to go about like oh. defining what this meant this at this time. You know, I mean, I probably a lot of us have picked up the how to do nothing book in the last, you know, nine or 12 months or something like that. And I really, you know, I might not agree with all the pieces of that book, but I really do believe in the idea of re sort of, getting a better perspective on what is creative time and what do we need as artists and as creatives and as producers to live a life that can have moments of inspiration in them, you know, as a artist, as a, as a business owner, as a parent, like I'm juggling a lot of things and I, and I'm, and I like juggling those things. I'm, I'm very happy. I feel very blessed and uh, I've had a long career and I've done all that career for the most part, other than being on airplanes too often from my home. Um, I, and so efficiency, you know, as much as I, if this is not something which works with my wife, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's like a silly, silly goal that was never, you know, at least in my particular thing, uh, what I was trying to achieve. I think that, you know, in terms of the last six months in lockdown, the thing that strikes me is that so many people, especially in my industry, were already in the precipice of something new and we're building something and February came, March came and just like, just wash the foundation out. And so what it's really been about is finding out what you really want. What do you want your creative life to look like? And then making choices, which help you use this time, not to be more efficient, not to necessarily learn skills. Cause I'll put that in the same category as things which are, are, are very valid and important things for some people, but not necessarily what we all need to be trying to do but to try to better for yourself understand 
what are the projects and what are the people you want to be working with on in the next five years, next 10 years, next 20 years? And I think what we'll find after this is that people have a much better sense of self as artists. And, and we sort of turbocharge that with the, some of the social movements we've been through in the last several months. And that has even further refined and pushed people in terms of understanding their identities as artists. And so I kind of see it, um, I, you know, photography and especially editorial photography and magazines, they made this long-term bet on the internet not being a big deal, which they've been paying for the last 15 years. And this has just been the last, you know, final sad push into the, you know, oblivion. And so my client base will be forever altered moving forward. And I can either, you know, cry into my beer over that or six months ago, really more like three years ago, I've already been building the future and trying to figure out what can be next for me and what I really want to do, what I really want to say. Um, there are creatives who have a job which is a lot to do with picking up a phone and responding to an opportunity. And then there's a lot of things they can do with that opportunity, but it, it doesn't necessarily, they're, you know, photographers can often be at the very end of a creative line. I think a lot of photographers after this are going to be pushing themselves much further up the line and be much more conceptual about how they perceive the new projects they want to work on. And so that will, I think, create a lot of really very interesting work out in the world. Well, what I like about what you were saying in terms of, you know, artists right now and kind of the existential crisis that everyone's sort of going through and understanding both systemic issues and just frankly, how we want to spend our time and spend our lives. And I think even just being home and even with the sort of, you know, good, bad and ugly of, you know, being around your family 24 seven, nowhere to escape, nothing like it, it, it has broken down some walls that I think I've found, you know, very helpful when it comes to writers and storytellers, because, mm -hmm. you know, part of my job is to push people to go deeper and to try to understand what they really want to message out with what, whatever they're spending their time and years uh, in some instances, you know, dedicating themselves to. And when the world is going through what it's going through, it causes people to really evaluate and nothing can be fluff anymore. And now there's a careful balance because I think the other thing we've realized as storytellers is we don't want to do stuff that's dark for the sake of dark. And there's going to have to be a balance of both being real and honest, but also have some fun because next year after that we get through this terrible 2020 i don't think we're going to want to sort of continue to be in the pit of despair even in our entertainment and so but what's been interesting is seeing how much growth people are going through and how that's then reflecting on their stories and having to put themselves through a different filter of am i saying something meaningful am i trying to get something that will change the world not in a big pollyanna sort of way but just like even talking about one issue or two issues and what's important to the person telling that and and i've seen that it, it doesn't mean, mean it's easy and people are going through it but i can tell in the work um, especially on the things that we were working on before and then the, that have carried through and after there's a change. And, and that I would say is a, is a positive for, you know, what the goals are for what people are trying to talk about. I, uh, I'm curious on a, on a, a little bit more of a personal note for the three of you, what are you finding creatively fulfilling right now? Like what's, what's, it's not necessarily work related since you're all creative in your own right. Like what's, what's keeping you going? I think there's, you know, I, you referenced the waves of things. And I think that to me has always been a big part of it. And, you know, early on, I, as a parent, um, was able to see exactly where my kids, my kids are uh, almost seven and four years old. And they've been in preschool and now one's in, just started first grade. So you know sort of where they're at, but now you're hands-on learning with them and building with them and creating with them and doing hikes with them and you, you really know exactly where they're at exactly last week they were like this but this week they're kind of on this weird little crazy thing like my four-year-old has been like at breakfast being like yep yeah, this got text from my girlfriend I'm like okay so first of all uh, you never you don't text you don't have a girlfriend like you know like it's like uh you know and i just i love being so close to the little brains and like just seeing the weird crazy ways they go now I also like desperately would love someone to send me on some extravagant, very long, you know, complicated <laughs> shoot in some other country for a long time, which I probably would get divorced because of. But regardless, um, that's been really cool and really powerful for me. And then dealing with that photographically and not even really photographically, just visually 
uh, with them and, and making things with them and sort of trying to document some of, this. some of the assignments I've done in the last six months have been, hey, uh, what's going on at home? Shoot that for me kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've done a little bit of that before. So it wasn't totally crazy to like turn the lens on my own family and my own life. But it's very interesting and very hard and uh, in certain ways to like dig in and like make it real and make it good. So I, I've been kind of doing there. John, does that give, like, does that happen in the reverse where you're sort of noticing what your kids go through in school and texting girlfriends, but do they also now have an appreciation and, and sort of witness to what you get to do? And do they, or your, or your wife, like, are there, are there, is there an appreciation or questions or things that come that maybe wouldn't have happened had you not kind of worked from home for so long? I think that it's, yeah, when, because so much of what I've done is getting on a plane and now some of it is being produced literally here, you know, and I, now the, the podcast, there's, you know, I'm across from the podcast studio in my basement. And so that is, that is happening and that's cool. The, now impression, are they impressed by it? Definitely not. You know, my kids are, <laughs> you know, are very, very rightfully to be unimpressed. And certainly my wife is very made this very clear to them that you know, what dad does is nice that's nice but uh it happens that my <laughs> wife is in medicine and so everything i'll oh, ever do is right. worth you money. you say you save lives she saves lives like I, well i it. would never say i save lives for sure but oh, we all have the rest of us all have <laughs> okay good, 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 good. uh what about you hannah what's going what what's what's getting you going um, you know, I look at the world around me right now and I, you know me for a while so you know I'm real conscious about what's going on and it's always been a real well for me of inspiration looking at social issues. So uh, seeing the world around me and explaining it to my four-year-old son um, and trying to wrap his head around what does it mean when you see certain things on the news or you hear us talking about things really inspires me to stay with my passions you know so um yeah i would say it's so it's such a simple statement but it's true it's it's the fire that sort of burns in me all the time is how can we um as human beings be more connected and treat each other better you know well i mean i think there's a relief in the fact that you know a lot of us were aware of these issues for a long time. And I think that being able to talk about them in a workplace and being able to talk because they're usually you're like, you got to leave that at home. You like that you have to sort of conform and acclimate to whatever the professional environment you're, you're in. And so things would just perpetuate and continue. And so it's interesting, you know, for me in a like corporate environment to be seeing some of these really frank conversations happening with the hope of, you know, for instance, empowering the right storytellers and or the right mix of storytellers. And, um, um, and that goes from production to writers to everything. And um, honestly, with as difficult as everything is and as difficult as it is to face some of these things, I at least feel like people are paying attention. And that drives me because it's not that all the solutions are here at our fingertips and here we go, we've solved it, but at least it feels like an awakening has occurred and everyone is like ready to at least engage on it, you know? I want to go on to our two-on-one, uh, but before I do that, something that's been really in my mind, I talk a lot about it with people. Um, you know, if, when you look at the first two, three months of the pandemic, it was very much about same, same, and really almost a pandering of, we're all in this together and it's the same shot of the nurses. And it's the, you know, we all saw that. We saw it in, in every part of this industry. I would like to ask, and if you don't have it, don't, you know, I don't want to put you in the hot seat on this, but who's doing creativity like who stands out to you right now it doesn't have to be in your part of the industry who stands out to you right now as they're doing something really cool i mean obviously for me it's you know, i look at what nike does and you know they're up way out of shrine but it's not just storytelling for storytelling's sake it's not pandering it's you know there's something really um wonderful about just being raw and open and it doesn't feel like they're trying they're trying to be with and not at and pander so, so i'd love to hear if if any of you have and again if you don't you don't but um who's doing it well right now michaela cohen uh, i may destroy you i like i'm just so moved by that show and the creativity behind it it's it's i i loved it i was really moved by it and i was like this is the kind of creativity that i'd love mm -hmm. to see We'll make sure we put a link to that up on our site because I agree, that's really cool. Yeah. 
who else? I also just think right now, uh, authors who were already working on books about systemic racism and sort of some of these issues have had to pivot to suddenly be conversation starters and public facing and even frankly broker conversations, you know, to artist groups or companies and things like that, because, you know, not every author is ready to like go and mediate uh, people. And I think that's something where I've seen and witnessed. There's a woman, for instance, Dr. Kira Banks, who does this work. And I think it's one thing to be an academic or a scholar or write these things or write op-eds and that's sort of, but it's another to like actually engage with people and try to answer the hard questions or answer the questions that people feel are the dumb questions when trying to learn how to sort of fix some of these problems. Problems. So I've just been really impressed. Even when you watch the news and you see some of these sort of experts come on and talk about things, um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily thinking their whole lives that they're being trained to like be in a public forum. You know, it's, it's a lot about the written word and writing those pieces. So that I've been kind of impressed by and, and moved by. For me, it's been not anything in particular, but just thoughtfulness in general, you know, and, and a lot of the voices I've heard that we're trying to deal with things well were in the podcast space and just people trying to like sort through you know wow this is this is crazy and what does this mean and what is my role here and that kind of different thing you know one of the cool things we've gotten to all do as creatives is to kind of go back in time to our former selves and sort of re-engage with certain mediums whether it's books or tv or you know people are seeing movies they've wanted to see for the last 15 years you know, I got to resubscribe to the New Yorker and read it weekly, which is something I haven't been able to do successfully since I was, I don't know, late in college or something like that. Um, and the thoughtfulness of the weekly form or the, you know, even more so the monthly form in terms of processing this, which on a daily headspace way is just perplexing and wildly just, you know, moving us left to right and, and front to back. I think that was something I was really impressed by. And on the opposite side, especially early on, so many brands were engaging with us. Like, I know you're so bored at home. Here, buy some shit. I mean, I know that maybe you and your little bubble don't see the same way I see things. And, you know, we've been very lucky to have health and safety, you know, through most of this, even though it's touched my life and my family's lives in different ways. But the idea that, we can just just disappear it and only just cling on to capitalism through this whole thing to get us through is so wildly insane. You know, it's just, it's just like, you know, I actually, there was a moment last night, uh, last night the NFL played their first game. The fans, the limited fans in the, in the, the stadium were booing. And you're like, okay, well, let's, let's drill down on what are you booing right now? Like, what are you, lucky few, 20% or whatever the capacity was of Arrowhead Stadium last night, what have you decided in this moment to boo? And then what should be the reaction of these men on the field? And they're lucky they were watching a basketball game because if it was a basketball game, those teams would have stood up and walked the fuck out. And they would have been 100% and right to do it. So we're all going to have to get to the other side of this with a lot of thinking about where, what's our role here. So I think, you know, the brands uh, who have done this well, you know, I've seen some really beautiful Apple stuff about, you know, creative creativity at home, you know, their first major piece they did was just kind of gorgeous and subtle and like felt right. And, you know, it looked a little hard to achieve, but, you know, there's been great work and all that work took a breath mm -hmm. is, you know, is what I've seen and tried to s examine what good could I put into the world and also underscore what my brand's doing, what, what we believe in as a brand, but they took a breath and they looked around and they, then they moved forward. Thank you for that. I think, um, I think we can move on now to the two on one with Joey. Um, and just dedicate a little bit of time now to sort of wrap our head around specifically what you're working on. Um, tell us a little bit about, about what's going on at HBO Max, specific to the fact that you've launched in the pandemic that you're about to go up or are going up in, you know, with production again and all of those challenges. I think there's a lot that you could probably just kind of give us a quick overview on. We'd love to hear how, how things are happening for you in your now. 
Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting mix of excited because here we are and it's a year and a half worth of, you know, working towards and developing and building towards, but then it's also in a pandemic that it's happening. And so it was sort of the mixed emotions of, ah, finally, we're a thing, not quite how we planned on it. And you can't kind of, you know, uh, toast a glass of champagne with your coworkers. But I think um, in, in the way that you're trying to find the joy and excitement in anything and any version of it, because things have just changed, it's been nice to have something that, you know, frankly, gives people some distraction and hopefully fun at home because we're all just stuck here. And I've never loved watching TV and movies more because, gosh, we like in, in California, especially even this week, you can't even go outside and breathe, a, you know, have a breath of fresh air. And so, you know, it, without, um, you know, thinking your work is too so being too self-important about it it has really given me an appreciation for what we all get to do which is sort of give people things to listen to and to watch and all of that um and so yeah right now we are sort of you know finally gearing up to put everything back on its feet and um you know one of the great benefits that i've had is it gave us these months to with writers really think about what we're doing and 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 you know put another coat of paint on it and really make sure that they're great as opposed to sometimes based on deadlines and budgets and everything we're talking about you're just going 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 which doesn't mean that you're going to make something bad but once in a while i, I think john what you were saying before about taking a breath it, it's even beyond just sort of this moment i think it's just a good lesson for creativity is you know it's good to have deadlines but once in a while you do need to sort of breathe, reassess. Are we going the right direction? Is this the best version it can be? And that's what we've been doing. And so the past kind of even week has been particularly exciting for me because we had our first show go, go back up. We, uh, I had a table read yesterday that was virtual via Zoom, which is totally bizarre. And, you know, usually you're in person and you're, you know, excited with your cast and your director and everything. You're like, all right, let's go. And there's something about the camaraderie of that that I miss. But at the same time, you know, I got to see everyone on screen in close up like this. And in a weird way, that was actually really helpful because I'm going to be watching them on screen as actors anyway. So uh, it's the weird kind of unexpected benefits of that. So yeah, we're just starting to get back up. But in, meanwhile, the lights are on and the service is up and people are watching and really liking stuff. Tell us, um, I'm sure that, you know, you've, you've had to explore new types of technologies or different type of production techniques or other types of creative revisions that have gone along in, in this process. Can you fill us in on, on some of those things? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just wild to see how new this whole thing is with, with um, streaming and how people want to watch and how, you know, so even like the way that people consume now, what we've been sort of trying to learn from is, okay, obviously Netflix introduced a binge culture where you can watch everything at once whenever you want it. Um, but we also saw the other side of that, which was sort of our creators and people who would pour so many uh, hours and years into a certain piece, you know, in the, in the worst case, in the best case scenario, I'll start with the best. Someone watches it over two days and they love it and they talk, talk about it and what an experience. In the worst case scenario, though, everyone's busy, oh, even now, even during the pandemic and a week goes by. And if your show dropped all in a day, it's like, that, that's it. So it's been interesting with now in streaming because I've, I've kind of grown up in the broadcast world and basic cable world where you were held to a calendar and, and, and you know, a weekly schedule that for the first time in my career, we get to really sort of play with that. And we've been modeling a sort of, you know, in small batches so that you still have several episodes to watch at the same time. If you want to like dedicate your Saturday to just not leaving the couch, which I've been doing a lot lately, but, um, you know, spreading it over a month or a month and change. So at least there's a cultural conversation and uh, people can talk about it. And so like Hanel or you talking about I May Destroy You, it being on HBO, what's so nice is people are trained to be weekly on shows like that, but we're able to with HBO Max, give a like a similar but slightly different experience where you can talk with your friends every week about the show, but if you wanna watch three here, two here, two there, we're giving you that option. So in terms of just the basics of my job, which is like making shows and giving them to an audience, even that's been different for me this past year and where streaming is. Joey, I, you know, I think about the parameters that have changed and you are in a, a lot of people that are going to be watching this are people that, like I said, are, are more vendors for, and you have an insight into kind of the bigger world that, that many people strive to be part of, but they don't necessarily understand um, exactly. It's not like it's that much more glamorous. It's just bigger. The budgets are bigger. Otherwise it's somewhat the same, but how much, even in that bigger, where you know, normally we think of uh, HBO, we're thinking Game of Thrones, but at the end of the day, 
you're still having to have the same problems that everyone's having, even if you are a mom and pop shop. What have been the real changes you've seen or are seeing right now um, because of COVID and working from home? And um, are you, are, and, and more importantly, are you excited by those? Like, are you seeing things that are like, it's about time. You mentioned like less people on set and how exciting that is. Um, what are you, how has this changed how you operate and how is that good and how is that bad? Well, in, in the creative side of, you know, development, which is the majority of my job and, you know, the other half being the actual production, you know, development is requires focus and time. And I think because, you know, we were talking about efficiency earlier. I mean, for me myself to not be in meetings all day and in conference rooms, but instead to be uh, you know, at home where I can read in peace, talk to my creators. I mean, it gets a little, you know, without boundaries as we all I'm sure experience, like I'm getting texts and calls at like all the hours, but I love it. And like, you know, it sometimes is inconvenient because you're eating dinner. Yes. But like the, the core of what I love about doing this is helping people problem solve. And, th and there's no budget. There's no sort of size or scope or, or kind of thing that, that, that takes that away. That's all that will always exist. And, and creative people are creative people for a reason. And will always have things they want to talk out or be passionate about or, you know, disagree with whatever. So that will never change, and but has changed for me only in the sense of I'm more available to do it and to, and to enjoy that part, which I, which is what I love. The production part's interesting. I mean, you know, I'll be honest, it's, it's, I'm just now kind of at the beginning of it because we were all on hold for so long. And so it is interesting that, and it does feel like as an industry, we're all kind of trying to learn from each other, you know, and because um, it's one thing to get the testing facilities and get the machines and get all that and that's all happening and cost money and everything's slower and all that but um but you also just have to remember that everyone's human and we're all just trying to figure it out and and no one wants to get sick and you want to make everything as safe as possible and um we're certainly doing that but you just kind of have to put one foot in front of the other and i think it, it reminds everyone that there's no rule book in general to make stuff and be creative everyone intends to make a great piece of art and you know most of the time it doesn't end up being great so we all strive for that but i I think similarly, just in terms of process, you all want to be the most efficient, the most everything, but it's, it's a process and it's a, it's, it's a learning period. Um, um, but going back earlier to, to your earlier points in the question, I mean, you know, yeah, there's some smart efficiencies that are happening too. And I think um, one of those things is like, even just in terms of um, production kind of being mapped out in a, in a way, like I'll tell you one random thing. Like I have one of my shows is set in a high school and because people aren't in school right now, guess what? That's basically our set. Like we, we don't have to wait for <laughs> kids to come in and out. And so there's like a, there, there are the unexpected sort of pluses where I never would have thought of that. And like, well, yeah, kids are being homeschooled right now. Guess what? Your, our set is right here. So there's like the those kind of odd things. Um, but also there, there are sort of creative things that are happening, like um, when a certain location feels like it's probably not right for COVID safe protocol. Um, this happened with an aquarium that we were shooting at for another one of my shows. And so we, we had to kind of rewrite and figure out a new path. And it ended, up, it ended up being more original, actually, and kind of quirky and funny. The tone of that show is sort of a, a dramedy. So there are moments like that where, of course, for the first day, everyone's bummed because their dream location and story wasn't going to work out. But then they've pivoted and it's, and it's something cool now, you know? I have one last question since there's a variety of different types of chaos in the world at the moment. This one's a little bit more industry specific, uh, but there have been a lot of executive shakeups and changes throughout the, the TV landscape at studios and networks and streamers and whatnot. Um, just curious to know, like, do you see that as a product of what's been happening as a product of opportunity for the, the, the ability to make some changes? What do you think that that means for sort of the future of, of the business as a whole? Yeah, there's a lot of changes. I mean, you know, having only done this in my career, I, when I really think about it, every few years, this does happen. I'm always surprised, like every time it does, like, oh my God, what? Change? But then when I really think about it, it's like kind of, you know, custom. But I will say, I mean, on the human side, I feel like everyone's at home and thinking about things a lot. And it forces you from a creative standpoint to efficiency standpoint, everything we've talked about, it forces you to go, are we doing this the best way? Is this the way 
way this should go. And I think that change comes from, you know, having the time and space to actually evaluate. So I think that a big part of it is just everyone's taking a breath, looking at themselves, looking at what they do, looking at their family, looking at how things are done, how companies run. And so I definitely feel around town that that is happening. And look, it's no lie or it's no, it's no mistake rather that um, some of those things are happening because of you know, people's behavior and, and who is a good leader, who is a great leader and who's not a great leader. And I think some of those changes which starts the dominoes falling um, have certainly happened. And I think that is a different part that um, I'm excited about, which is people are held accountable for how they conduct themselves in these jobs, not just what the sort of results are they yield. And that's being factored in. That's a big reason why some of these things are, are happening. Not every everything, but you do see um, some changes up top uh, have to do with culture as well. And uh, I think that's a, an improvement, or I hope it's an improvement. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what I also hope in the streaming environment specifically is, you know, we're all at the beginning, but we've also had a few years to see how things are going. So I think everyone's sort of looking to the successes of others or the failures of others and seeing how it goes. I mean, even just as recent as this past month, seeing because of the pandemic, but also we were going to get here anyway when it came to features, seeing what Disney Plus is doing with Mulan and saying, okay, this was meant for theaters. Let's just see. Will people pay this extra $27.99, whatever it is, to, to see the movie? And I'd be curious curious if we would have gotten there anyway had we not all be been stuck at home and not being able to go to the theaters so there's things like that that i think are informing leadership how we make decisions how we take risks and say hey let's take the movie let's put it in your homes let's see what happens you know and i think that's fairly exciting to see what what could be possible yeah i think that's going to be fascinating and thank you for all that insight that's a lot of time to uh, have to answer questions and uh, <laughs> no one else is responding so i have a question for everybody to get everybody back in but i'm going to i'm going to say it off of something that you said earlier joey that i actually wrote down cuz i thought it was a great um, line and you said you know are we after the pit of despair uh, people want to be entertained again. As we look into the next, is there going to be kind of like, you know, after 9-11, it was all about a groundswell of everything had to be patriotic. I had a, I had a film that got shelved because uh, it didn't deal with patriotism. Um, it dealt with social activism and they didn't want that then. Um, so do you think that after all of this is over in 20, uh, in 2021, everything's going to be fun and try to get us away from the pit of despair. And um, if not, where do you see the next? Where do you see us uh, a year from now? I think that you've already started out on a very positive note by identifying 2021 as the opposite side of this, which I think is wildly <laughs> enthusiastic. Um, I try. I try. I, I, I love it. I love it. I, I hope at least for my side of the creative industry, that it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase it as pandering, but I, I, whenever things are dark economically, just in photography, more and more and more lifestyle photographers are hired to make things look rosier and rosier and more sun-kissed because they're like, they want you to, you know, just like, just, uh, just fine. It's fine. It's fine. Just click that button. It's fine. Just, you're fine. And I think because of that mentality, the places we can go for original content, especially wonderfully unique, eclectic storytelling from, from a traditional publishing standpoint have been just thrown out because the thing happens where they think they know what people want, so they give them what they want, but they never actually assume the people who love their product had any intelligence at all. So it becomes this disgusting, terrible race to a bottom. So I think positive stories are very important. And I think that if anything, we've learned through the last several months, you know, in Black Lives Matter and holding the police accountable and other things, that there are really important American stories that are positive to tell everywhere. Uh, Lori, I, I, it feels like as a, someone who has done a lot of documentary filmmaking and activism, like, like you, you must have thoughts off of what John just said, but what do you think 2021 is? What's the next? I think there's going to be a lot of great documentary work in 2021 that really digs in. Um, but I think it's going to be even more exciting because we're going to be able to see conversations on major networks that haven't happened the way that they're going to happen. They're going to dig in 
Um, but I think they also, a lot of people are aware that you can't just dig into these dark stories or these dark parts of humanity without giving solutions, without empowering people. And that's where you start to get the energy um, in the story, you start to have something that's magnetic and um, I don't want to say fun to watch, but inspiring to watch and possibly even entertaining. So I think in 2021, we're really going to be able to see documentary evolve in a way that I've been excited for it too for quite a while. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're going to get some really fun stuff too because people do want to watch stuff. You know, I'm a love junkie. I watched Love Life and I was so glad when they decided to add more, when you guys gave more episodes. I was like, awesome. But I'm also glad you didn't release it all at once or else I would have stayed up all night, not gotten any sleep, watched the whole entire show and been falling in love. And but this way I got like three episodes at a time. So it's a little bit of binge, but not too much binge. So I do think 2021 will be a nice mix of empowering educational material that it can be dark, but can be also empowering, but then also fun stuff to watch because of course we, we need that too. You know, Sullivan's travel, that old, that old story. We need entertainment that uplifts us and make us, makes us laugh, especially in the hottest times as well. Yeah. Well, and I have to say too, an, another area that Hannah Lori I've seen and appreciated your work in is I think, you know, going back to what we were saying before, areas of thriving, music video culture and musicians have been doing such interesting things lately with the limitations whether it's like these music videos where there's one dancer one person on screen the entire time or animation that they're turning out really quickly where normally they wouldn't have used animation for a video but it's easier to do right now and i think that the but there uh, there's also a part to the music that's happening that it is conscious and there is something to be talked about. And so it is this great mix of both fun and escapist, but also aware. And I think that's what I'm hoping on the series side to do as well, which is I, I don't think anyone wants to sort of have anything constantly bleak. But one of the things that feels most sophisticated about storytelling these days is that nothing fits in an easy box. Things can be funny at times, dramatic at times, weird and sci-fi at times. And um, and I, I, you know, you, you early Early on in my career, it was like, you could work in comedy or you could work in drama. Okay. You're either the sci-fi person or you're the this <laughs> person. And I feel like now we're all able to sort of blend things. And I think that owns up to the tonal question of yours, which is you can have some moments that are hopeful, but you can also like talk about some real stuff. And I think that's the future. And that's what I hope next year will be too in, in, in all those areas. So I feel like maybe yes 2021 but you know certainly in the life cycle of making a movie or a television show it already takes you a year to two years to make them but i also think people's own growth is going to take a minute so i bet in 2022 and 2023 we're just going to have some incredible art and storytelling and things i'm really excited to to see i agree a thousand percent it's there's going to be that texture and that detail that suddenly slides into place with all these other pieces and then, you know, and whoever that is for the whatever artist that will be, it will be extremely powerful. But yeah. it's interesting that we had levied that charge against, you know, a certain young generation. And now we find them really at work doing the hard work that, you know, they had been had been left for them to do by, you know, the boomers or whomever you want to levy mm -hmm. this at. Well, that is a beautiful way to segue because I want to be very cognizant of our time. Um, in all honesty, this is very uplifting for me. Thank you all very, very much. I, I feel, I always say this to T before we start, like, I hope I get something out of this that I, I, that I can glom onto. And I really feel that. And I think that that is why we're doing this. We're doing this because yeah. we want people to feel reassured that being a creative person in 2020 to whenever is a good thing and that what we do matters. Um, and you are all great on that. So we, we definitely want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. I, I want to reiterate the same thing. I think Patrick and I needed this as well too. Just we've had our heads down a lot in the business of the business, so to speak. Um, and, and yes, that's an important part of things that has to keep things moving. But um, to remember the heart and soul of the creativity behind it is, is much needed right now for me. So thank you guys very much. Yeah, absolutely. But with that, uh, we are going to transition for those of you watching. We are wrapping up, but as we wrap up, we want to remind you of next week's poll. Um, as always, uh, you can go to the distillery.live to answer the poll. Next week's poll. In this season of less than normal, which 
we all have agreed that that's where we are. How important is sharing the wealth across your creative community? Now, I don't mean financial wealth. I mean psychological wealth. I mean, I mean uh, occupational wealth. Are you a hoarder? because you're not quite sure. I mean, this kind of goes on this week's poll. Are you uh, I don't quite know and I'm a hoarder or are you absolutely all in what's mine is yours? So please log on to the distillery live and let us know your thoughts. You can also leave us comments. Uh, you can also suggest new topics. And of course you can suggest other guests. Yes, and speaking of um, our guests today, thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Hanalori, Joey, John, um, you guys have been a great addition. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you, guys. Uh, and T, as always, thank you for uh, joining me on this adventure. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, it's been fun. It continues to be. And remember, go to the distillery.live and become part of this community. This is really meant for you. So we hope you participate. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. The future is now.